is now recording. Welcome everyone to the uh, second Open Science Community Delft uh, coffee discussion. Um, my name is Emmy Tang. I am the Open Science Community Delft's coordinator and facilitator of this session. Joining me today, very happy to have Esther Plomp. Esther, you wanna introduce yourself quickly? Sure, my name is Esther. I'm a data steward at the Faculty of Applied Sciences, and today I'm going to monitor your questions. So if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. And um, if you're happy to do so, you can also post them yourself at the end. So do let me know if you don't want to do that, and then I can read them out. Thanks. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, some housekeeping at the beginning of our discussion. Um, this the event is jointly organized with the TU Delft Diversity Office. So thank you very much for giving us the chance to be part of the TU Delft Diversity and Inclusion Week. Um, check out the rest of the program for the remaining two and a half days of the week. Uh, we'll put a link to that towards the end of the event. Um, this is a community event, so it does uh, operate under our Open Science Community Delft Code of Conduct. I'll put a link to that, uh, to the full text in the chat right now. So you can go and have a look if you uh, wish to, but the gist of that is please be respectful and kind. And if you um, witness or are a victim of any um, harassing behavior uh, during this event, please email me. Um, my email address is in that for uh, code of conduct. I, will, I must say, I because I'm facilitating the session, so it's making this a little bit tricky, but I will be keeping an, an eye on the inbox, particularly during the parts that Esther is facilitating. So I'll respond to that. Um, if anything comes up, I'll respond to it during those times. And if the report is against my, it's for something that I did, then please follow the uh, procedures in the code of conduct to go to the TU Delft relevant offices. Um, the other thing that I want to say is uh, we might touch on various topics during this call. If you, um, if you want to leave at any point, please do. You don't have to explain yourself, just leave. And if you wanna come back at any point, also just feel free to come back. There's no problem at all. Uh, just a little bit on the format of today's event. Uh, we are very, very grateful to have three panelists joining us today. Um, I'll start off with some questions for our panelists. And then afterwards, we'll be opening the floor for all your questions and comments, as Esther mentioned. Um, so you can, during the, um, the question and answer, the open question and answer, you can use the raise your hand button, which I think is in the, oh, this is the part that I always forget. Yes, in the reaction button on the bottom of your Zoom menus, if you click reaction, there's an option to raise hand. Um, and we will ask you to unmute yourself. Or you can also type your questions and comments in the Zoom chat at any point, and Esther and I will collect them and either ask them on your behalf, or if you wish, you could also be unmuted uh, when the time comes. Okay, I hope that is clear. Um, questions, Zoom chat, please. I will briefly introduce our fantastic panelists. I'm very grateful to have Errol Fox. They are a product manager, designer for open source tools and a PhD candidate at the Open Lab Newcastle in the UK. Uh, we have David, uh, who is a farmer at Growing Gold Farms and a fellow at the Stanford Digital Civil Society Lab. And last but not least, we have Roberto, who is a associate professor in spatial planning and strategy at the Technical University of Delft. But I would ask, our panelists to give a better introduction of themselves. Uh, so if we could, yeah, that's sort of my first question. Um, if we could ask our panelists to introduce themselves to everyone. So if we could start with Errol. Sure. Uh, hello, um, nice to be here with you all. So yeah, my name is Errol, my pronouns are they, them. I have been in the design and technology space for just over 10 years now, I think. Um, I was not trained in design and technology. I was self-taught. Um, my education background is, is not uh, techie, as it were. So I'm, I'm kind of one of those people that moved into technology um, in kind of later life, as it, as it were. 
Um, always had an interest in it though. Um, I worked in commercial companies, proprietary software and for profits before um, deciding to move into NGOs and open source software. Um, open source software that primarily focused on humanitarian and human rights related needs. My first open source um, organization that I joined as um, two kind of leads of the design user, user centered design team was at Ushahidi. Um, uh, before then I was really interested in open source software from a, from a kind of just casual kind of perspective. Um, but my work at Ushahidi was where I started to become really interested in how design participates in the openness um, of software and other kinds of openness as well. I am interested in diversity and inclusion because I am a person that is to some extent marginalized within different spaces. And I actually got really interested in diversity and inclusion when I was in my commercial um, roles. And I was seeing things happen that I didn't quite know how to, at the time, argue with. Things that were bad taste, things that were non-inclusive, ways that the organizations kind of actively discouraged designers particularly and then the technologies that the designers work with so you know the, the team that kind of produce tools from really being human-centered and user-centered essentially and to me that meant to be human-centered and user-centered means to be as understanding and aware of the different complexities around diversity, inclusion and intersecting identities as we possibly can be given our own intersectioning identities as well. So um, I identify as queer, I identify as non-binary, I um, also had a, have a hidden disability that is um, very well hidden a lot of the time but I was really interested in how we as designers serve these kinds of um, communities with, with what we do. I now work at an organization called Simply Secure. So I focus again on open source software technology and human rights tools uh, with my work. Um, I do product management and design there and lots of other things. Um, and also started my PhD this, this year in how do designers get involved in humanitarian open source software and human rights open source software. So. This is, uh, this is my world, design and open source um, and inclusion. And that's me. Fantastic, thank you, Errol. Uh, David? That's great, Errol. For me, David Salasipuk, I was born um, and my upbringing kind of put a sense of social, responsibility and privilege in the sense that I was raised to be aware of what is around me and the way that I can give back. That, that's what my family had always instilled. And the closest idea to do that for me in, the, in my childhood was becoming a doctor. Because when I had malaria once a year, it was the doctors that made me feel better. So that was my sense of being able to give back to the community. I was privileged enough to go to United World College in Costa Rica. Um, the first time I was in class with over 65, people from over 65 different countries blew my mind, made what I was seeing on TV much more tangible and actually contradicted a lot that I was seeing. So that was changing the way I thought about things and saw things. Going on the path of becoming a doctor, um, got the chance to go to the US to study there. Um, decided to study bioinformatics around that time because that was the way to combine both and technology with a plan to go towards Silicon Valley. And my dad, who is now a farmer for over 40 years, would ask me, I see you so excited about all these algorithms that you are learning about in class, but how do I apply that to my farm? How do I make that tangible to me? That is when I realized that most of us who are techie um, kind of enjoy being so sophisticated and complex, but the people who may leverage these technologies are a little bit removed from that. So I started spending time finding ways to make technologies, algorithms, computer science concepts, 
more accessible to somebody like my father. And that led me towards the path of data literacy. Around that time, I was fortunate enough to move back home to Ghana to work at a tech incubator, um, helping African entrepreneurs who were starting their business think about data and how they can leverage that for their work. And then I left a year and a half after that to join Open Knowledge Foundation, which works in the open data space, led their Africa work, and then eventually their global data training. I did that for about two and a half years. Then also joined Open Contracting Partnership, where we're trying to solve um, public procurement across the world. Uh, there's a data element to that. Now I tell those stories because all those experiences allowed me to work and travel in over 30 different countries across five continents. And the theme that I was seeing was that a lot of technology, a lot of things around data was being developed for resource endowed environments. So when you talk about resource endowed environments, places where there was high availability of internet, there was high tech savviness that was expected. And we're talking about different groups that had resources available to them. But I started finding that a lot of the people that needed some of these interventions were working in resource constraints environments. So I started switching my efforts towards that. Realized that to be able to really um, be involved in how we change the narrative, I needed to step away from that space. So in 2019, December, I left my job to go work with my dad um, on a farm setting up growing gold farms. And the reason for that, we can talk about that a little bit more, but farmers play a very interesting role um, creating the food that we eat. Um, they are very talented individuals, but most of the time they are thought of as people who are not educated, people who don't know much. So we need to throw technology at them. So Growing Gold Farms is saying that farmers are some of the most creative individuals that we know of. How can we understand the knowledge that they possess and be able to work with them to elevate. We are not enabling them. We are elevating what they are doing so that they can actually become originators of um, technology to the food systems. And hopefully that can be applied across other ways that we design technology. So that's the kind of work that I'm exploring um, as a Stanford fellow. But for me, I see myself as somebody who enables learning, who spends time understanding who people are, their context, um, the way they've lived it, and if I can in any way enable them to remove whatever roadblocks that are preventing them from achieving their goals, that is what I do. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm excited to join this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And last but not least, Roberto. Well, um, well good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto. I'm an associate professor uh, uh, of spatial planning and strategy at TU Delft. Uh, I'm very humbled and honored to be here. I'm probably the person with the least interesting biography. I was born in Brazil and I uh, one beautiful day decided to, uh, to do a PhD. And uh, I was immensely lucky uh, when I was looking for a position to find a position at TU Delft that was uh, yeah, financed. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to to do it. So this was an opportunity that opened, you know, in, incredible opportunities for me. Uh, that happened uh, 17 years ago. So that's uh, quite a long time ago. I am a specialist in governance and regional planning, and I work as a consultant for the uh, European Commission in policy making. I work uh, especially with the Union for the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a, a group of countries in the Mediterranean um, that are kind of associated with Europe and, uh, and work together towards uh, sustainable uh, urbanization. So in my field, I actually see uh, diversity from this uh, perspective of um, how can we uh, face the big challenges that we have in our world today together? Um, and so maybe I'm a, I, I see diversity from a very institutional perspective, but also uh, understanding that um, all these uh, things that are happening in our world today, uh, climate change, um, growing inequality, erosion of democracy, all these big challenges, they can only be uh, 
truly faced if we work all together and if we learn uh, from each other and cooperate. So all my work um, has been in this direction of enabling people and uh, inviting people and uh, working with people in co-design and co-thinking what solutions can be. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much uh, it. I'm also the uh, diversity officer of my unit of the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, and we, I work with a team of 15 uh, students and staff trying to understand what are the many, many challenges of diversity uh, in our faculty. One thing that uh, maybe I just want to, to throw it out there is that um, we are uh, very careful not to um, sugarcoat um, diversity and, and make it a uh, make it a sanitized version of, of diversity. Uh, diversity comes with many, many challenges. It's not, it's difficult sometimes, and it's, it's uh, something that people have to work on. Uh, uh, becoming diversity officer, I, I really understood that there are many more challenges that I was even aware of. And uh, uh, becoming this uh, go-to person in my faculty, I started to listen to all these stories that I was not aware of. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's me in brief. Thank you, Roberto. Um, thank you, everyone, for being so generous with your stories and experience. Um, and I hope, yeah, I just feel very humbled by, um, yeah, all all your yeah experiences. And so, um, uh, hopefully that. I mean, that really sets the background nicely for our conversations forward. So uh, next question I'd like to ask is, what do you, what do you individually feel are the main represent, representation issues in our research, technology development and design processes and cultures? And what impact do these issues have? Uh, if I could, I'd like to start with David. I was hoping to feed off at this, uh, but I can I can get the bit. Thanks, Sammy. Um, so I can speak from um, the perspective. I'll use the perspective of farmers um, and just farming and agriculture, and maybe I can extrapolate that to what I'm seeing across tech. So currently in farming, you hear a lot of talk about um, agri tech. You hear a lot of talk about making sure that our food systems. Is more digitized and improved so that we can feed a lot of people. Now, what you end up finding is that a lot of this narrative is being pushed by a specific companies that have a specific idea of what food systems should do. And so whether it's Silicon Valley, whether it's coming from Europe, whether it's coming from most of the high um, income Western countries, that is the narrative that is being pushed out. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you follow that up, fundamentally is based on specific social behaviors, specific narratives, specific perspectives that really belittle or make other types of um, farming methods seem a little bit um, outdated. So then when, whether you're talking about drones, whether you're talking about GMO, it's a specific narrative that is being pushed and being touted as the way to go in the future. What is missing out, and if you give the case of my work where we're talking about subsistence farming, if you really research that out, you find that it's a system of farming that actually was designed over thousands of years to really pay attention to optimizing farming systems so that it benefits the society. Of course, it has limitations, but it was designed in a way to make sure that it was socially relevant, it was environmentally relevant, it was physiologically relevant, it was um, spiritually relevant, and, at the end, and it was also communally re relevant. Now, I give this example because when we start conversations based on narratives on Silicon Valley, on people who have access to resources, people who have one specific picture around how the world should look, then it means that we end up optimizing that research irrespective of the best practices that I use 
to really design that for a specific context, specific environment. And what that at the end of the day leads to is that a lot of people cannot access that. It means that when that context changes, in the case of maybe COVID, where we realize that not everyone can have access to high internet, then these solutions that we've built are missing out. So I think one of the biggest gaps, primarily using farming as example, is that we are starting conversations and we are given examples of what technology should look like, what research should look like, based on one narrative, what we consider as the leading example of or the target that we should go, and that is actually not advantageous to us. So that's what I'll start with. Who is designing what? Who are we marking as the example of where we want research and technology to be? And are we leaving out individuals who we consider either as uneducated, unexperienced, because we've created a narrative around what ideal should look like? And most of the time, this is based on either capitalist um, things that we like or specific environment and what we've optimized for. Beautiful questions. Thank you, Davis. Roberto? Uh, I, I'm going to try to address the, the question. Uh, I think um, people my age, I think, and people a bit older, uh, which are most of the management of our university, um, were born in a very different world, in a world where there was a Cold War, where the, wor uh, the world was super polarized and uh, knowledge was produced in two, basically two places. Europe and the United States, right? And uh, this world has disappeared. It has changed so absolutely dramatically that um, I think some minds um, are still, uh, you know, there is a little bit of inertia. Um, uh, so the, uh, we live in a very polycentric world where knowledge needs to come from from several uh, sources, from several places, and from several types of people. Uh, the producers of knowledge, which used to be the male white uh, Anglo-Saxon person, are not, are not the same. So we uh, need to listen much, much, much more to, uh, to other producers of knowledge. And I, I love what Dave, David was saying, because farmers are producers of knowledge. They have huge, huge knowledge that is not considered, um, yeah, they're not specialists or they're not experts. Uh, they don't have diplomas, but they, they have important knowledge. And I think the university, uh, all universities have to do a better job tapping on, on uh, into those resources and working with uh, people like the farmers, but other, other groups as well in which uh, we, we understand uh, tacit knowledge, knowledge that's not written many times. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, grow together, right? In, in co-design and co-creation. Co so yeah, my, my main thinking about it is that I come, I, uh, somebody just told me in, in the chat, uh, oh, you forgot to say where you are from. I'm, I'm from Brazil myself. Um, I was born in Sao Paulo, uh, which is one of the most diverse places you can ever imagine. It's really super diverse. Um, and I, I think I was lucky. Um, and I think uh, uh, that uh, I was part, uh, a li very little part of this internationalization of the, of the university. A lot of focus is given to the internationalization of the students, but uh, well, the, the teacher's body, the knowledge we are producing, and, and uh, many other things have become international. And uh, yeah, I think we have to move, move forward from um, and leave behind this world of uh, this, you know, where Europe and the United States were the only producers of knowledge and look uh, further, much, much further. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my answer to the question. Um, Errol? You... Yeah, um, I, I used to work at um, the Open Food Network. I popped a link in the chat and I, I, I feel weird saying this phrase that I loved hearing 
uh, David talk about the problems within the food system space in the sense that, oh, yes, I've seen them and I agree, uh, but I hate that they are problems in a sense. I hate that I hate that there is this assumption that we can't work with the food producers, the farmers directly around technology that serves them well and that the narrative is like for always like we're going to make this for them they, they can use this and it's something that comes back to a design related uh topic which is um and I've made a few notes so if you see me sort of glancing off to the side it's just because I've got a couple of notes on this screen over here um but design as a as a practice as a, a, a you know a job a role a, a thing that is done is deeply Eurocentric in its history and um, Western centric and absolutely um, until very recently, I would say, absolutely uh, deprioritized and actively um, shamed. I think a lot of design that comes from non-Western, non-Eurocentric cultures, because design is something that every culture has done well, designed tools, whether they're their products like physical items, whether they're services, whether they're methods of doing things. But there is like this colonial uh, view on like the good kind of design coming from the white sort of Western folks and the bad kind of design comes from apologies for using this term, but primitive cultures, which is completely untrue, that cultures have amazing ways of doing design in the ways that are appropriate to all the things that they know about their physical environment, the, their needs and things like that. So there's such a complex history here with, with design as a practice and design is done in everything, like everything is designed to some extent. So there, there's that. Um, and one of the things I said in my bio is that I don't have a design education and often I'm really pleased that I don't have a design education because I didn't um, actually get to experience that at a formative age in a sense that I came into design learning a lot later and I had a little bit more critical thinking I think than personally than I would have had if I was in my early 20s kind of going into a, a kind of standard design education in a sense. Things are kind of getting better. Um, I actually see a lot more people that are coming from different backgrounds into design and then going into design for technology, design for products and things like that. People with a psychology background, people with language backgrounds, basically every kind of um, life experience. If you if you have the skills to design appropriate good services with the people that need them, then you're going to typically be a good designer. That isn't also a very popular opinion in a lot of like older <laughs> communities of designers because, you know, gatekeeping exists as, as kind of things change and evolve, right? Um, and things get threatened, uh, like generations get threatened by kind of uh, the inclusive practices, essentially. Um, so things are getting better. There are actually a lot of courses and a lot of organizations. Um, I think the name of the lab is Creative Reactions Lab. It does a really wonderful course about decolonializing design. And it's a fantastic course. They also do fantastic talks as well. Um, I will double check the name of the organization, but I'm pretty sure it's Creative Reaction Labs. Um, Tech-wise, there's a really interesting dynamic about there's kind of an opposite dynamic in a in a way where design is devalued as a function and this often happens in technology spaces that are seen as highly technical so you know any kind of very complicated technological kind of um, innovation essentially and you actually find that designers as a role and as a function and as a practice don't really get included in spaces to do with like highly technical you know I'm kind of uh, highly technical in inverted commas because these technical things, these, these tools, these softwares, these processes definitely need user and human centered design to make them accessible and make them usable by actual humans that will use it. But yeah, there is this interesting uh, aspect of design that is excluded from some of these highly techy spaces because it's not seen as highly technical as a, as a function. Um, uh, because it's closer to needs finding, it's closer to users and things like that. So there's 
there's kind of an interesting perspective of design not being very inclusive as a practice, but also design not being inclu included as a practice within the spaces that it, it is really needed in technology. And especially from multiple diverse perspectives, right? Like, so design needs to do work to be inclusive, to, to include different kinds of designers that can then move into these technology spaces to make technology much more diverse and inclusive. Um, because I hear often when I when I talk about diversity and inclusion around design and diversity and inclusion from multiple different perspectives, I consistently hear people come come up to me afterwards. How do I sell this to my boss? How do I convince them to be more <laughs> diverse and inclusive um, and allow me the, the chance to design for more kinds of people and the opportunity to include more kinds of voices with who we design with? And I think that's so sad that designers often have to, you know, fight the, the fight of um, how to sell it in a, in a way. Um, and this is also heard a lot in the accessibility uh, inclu inclusion space. So like accessibility for people with impairments or disabilities is often the deprioritized um, hugely within technology tools for, for sure. Um, but generally a lot um, accessibility is consistently deprioritized and often has to have a value attributed to it beyond the inclusion aspect. So I've, uh, I've, I've covered quite a few different things there. I hope, I hope it's um, a reasonably good overview um, of some of the main issues around design specifically within uh, kind of diversity and inclusion lens. Thank you, Errol. Yeah, so yeah, we've covered a lot. In uh, thank you so much for to uh, David, Roberta, and Errol for you know giving us a very good um, overview of you know the, the voices perhaps that, that they think are really missing from our narratives. Um, I I'd like to give the the next sort of couple of uh, minutes uh, for uh, space for our panelists to sort of highlight some of the work that they've been doing to. To change that, um, and uh, and so maybe if I could start with uh, Roberto, if you could tell us a little bit about you know some of the fantastic initiatives that you've been organising to ensure that you know um, that knowledge from all around the world is valued uh, in your field of research. Uh, so one of the things that I uh, do is to try to open up uh, to the oft for people who cannot be here and who cannot afford to be here. And uh, the, the question of affordability uh, is super important because we know that uh, Tio Delft is embedded in Dutch society and it's accountable to the Dutch taxpayer. So it's not like we can um, maybe give uh, scholarships to everyone, uh, but we should give more scholarships and give more uh, uh, be more proactive attracting people to our university. Uh, people who are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there is a little bit of a fixation on working with, uh, with uh, UCL and MIT. And, and I think we should try to work with other universities in the global south that are not famous, for example, uh, and that are doing fantastic work. Uh, one of the things that I do is to uh, do visioning. Visioning is a very Dutch thing. We, we take it for granted in this country, but in many other countries, people don't do visions for the future. They just have to, to, to you know, uh, put out the fires that are there now. So they, they deal with emergencies all the time and they have less time or little time to, to envision a better, a better uh, future or, and uh, one of the things that I do, trying to uh, connect with people all over the world, bring them to Tio Delft and do this visioning exercise to solve those problems I was talking about, is this exercise, I just put the, the link on the, on the uh, chat. Uh, it's called Manifesto for the Just City. And uh, it's, a, it's a visioning exercise in which we ask students from all over the world to uh, imagine with us what, what a just city would, would look like and to write a manifesto, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 asking people to, uh, uh, well, prompting people for action. 
And uh, the response has been, so we did it last year uh, and we published a book. Uh, and by we, I, I hate when people use we, uh, who is we? Uh, me, my, uh, colleagues at Balkund, uh, Caroline Newton, and uh, a bunch of students also involved in, in this uh, project and partner universities. We, ha we have partner up with uh, universities. Uh, we uh, collected 43 uh, manifestos last year uh, from, uh, written by 172 students uh, from 25 universities. But uh, uh, the, 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 the workshop we promoted was much uh, bigger. We, we actually had people from 100 universities almost. <clears throat> In the end, we got uh, 43 manifestos and we published a book with that. And this year uh, we are doing the exercise again. Uh, we have more or less 400 people uh, registered. So it's, it's kind of growing. And uh, I am highlighting this experience because um, we really reach from China to, to Mexico. It's really uh, incredible. And uh, the dialogues and the learning uh, of this experience are so intense and it's so electrifying. And, uh, and people are, uh, yeah. I'm trying to put in practice this, this idea that knowledge needs to come from everywhere and not from, from certain places in order to, for it to be more robust. Um, yeah, apart from that, uh, I just want to highlight that uh, the, the, the work of the group of students and staff at, at Balkunde um, uh, doing this uh, diversity discussion is really important as well. So we need, uh, I think these groups of people all around the university discussing diversity and say, what, what is it that we want to talk about? What are people's problems and, and issues, but also opportunities and, and good stuff. Uh, by the way, I, I, sometimes I, I frame um, uh, uh, diversity as a challenge only, but it is not, it's, it's super pleasurable and, and, and joyful. And I think people, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful experience to connect with people who are different from you, right? Yeah, so these are, these are the two things that I, I'd like to put on the table, yeah. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah, definitely, we'll put a link to the book from the last set of manifestos as well, so everyone can have a look. Uh, David, uh, you've mentioned growing goat farms. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Okay. Yeah, so Growing Gold Farms, I'll set up the problem that we were um, trying to solve and, and how we're doing around it so far. So as I mentioned, my dad has been a farmer for over 40 years. This is literally what he's done his entire life. He didn't want to do anything else. Farming was what he knew. Um, and so we grew up being part of that, grew up spending time on the farm as we were still going to school um, during the, the academic times. Now, what is currently happening in Ghana, and maybe you'd be able to also connect to other parts of, of Africa. Different parts of Africa differ, different parts of Ghana differ, but primarily what we're seeing in Ghana is that there's increasingly a high dependence on importation of food in Ghana. Um, so food being brought in from different parts of the world and they are available in the malls, being sold at high prices and people are purchasing them and talk about the reasons why that happened. At the same time, you have local farmers who are producing a lot of cash crops. So coffee, cocoa, um, share nuts being sent outside. But at the end of the day, they are not making enough to be able to have a dignified living, right? So why is there that disconnect? Why is it that these talented farmers are producing all these cash crops being sent away, but at the same time, people are, we are importing things into the country. So what Green Gold Farm is trying to do is really change this current culture when it comes to farming for most farmers in Ghana. And the way that we want to do that is through four main phases. First of all, we want to demonstrate that we can not only produce food that Ghanaians love and want to pay money for, and eat in a healthy way. And we can go into different reasons why even actually eating food from where it's produced is actually much more beneficial than important things. So demonstrate that. But once we demonstrate that, 
be able to enable farmers to leverage different methods to produce this in a way that actually brings not only a high return to their pockets, but actually gives them a better living, lets them really enjoy what they're doing and gives them more opportunity to enjoy things in their community and the environment. So that's phase two. Phase three is, can we move farmers away, working with them from producing things and sending away so actually turning these products into other products that also really increase um, their resilience. So if somebody's producing pineapples, they're not just sending up pineapples away, can turn that into jam. They can turn that into, I don't know, different kinds of candy and things that really allow them to diversify their output. And then finally, this is actually very important. When you ask most people about what they think or the images that come to mind when you think about a farmer, they think about somebody in the bush, they think about somebody who is uneducated, they think about something that I don't wanna do or only have to do as a last resort if I can't find a way to get a job in the city. But when you think about a tech person or a tech entrepreneur, they think about somebody who's cool, somebody who has a nice place to live. We wanna change that. Can we make farms places of tourism places of education, places of luxury, so that young people are actually envisioning themselves as participating in the food system in Ghana. And so that's what Green Gold is setting out to do over the next 15, 20 years or more. And we thought it was important for us to actually start by being part of the communities that run farms. Even though my dad has been a farmer for over 40 years, I've grown up being a farm. We said we need to be humble enough to actually be part of the farming process, produce things together with farmers and learn the challenges that currently exist before we bring in any technology. So we didn't go in bringing in drones, bringing in high tech technology. We said, what are farmers currently doing right now? And how does it feel like, what are the pain points? And we've been spending time trying to understand that. A lot of pain points is hard to make us readjust. But one of the crucial things that we're able to show is that it is possible to not only produce local foods that people want, but even the things that are being imported. So you have a growing number of people who have an appetite for kale, for bok choy. We've been able to demonstrate that you can grow that and make it available and people are ready to purchase. The final thing that I'll say that we're learning is there's a lot of re-education that needs to be done. You currently have people who have been exposed through television, social media, where you ask a young person, including myself when I was young, what is your favorite fruit? And mine used to be strawberry. I had never tasted a strawberry in my life, but from watching Cartoon Network, I said my favorite fruit was a strawberry until I tasted that. That needs to change. So we have to let people recognize that instead of wanting a spinach, which is not necessarily local, there's an alternative called boko boko, which is not similar, but even has more nutrients and it's actually tastier, introducing young people to that. But I'm working with a friend who started an organization called Wonder Space that is working with young children to really take trips to farms, to be able to understand narratives around people involved in the food system so that we will start letting people appreciate food, but also the people who are part of that, including farmers, so that they can see themselves as even if I wanna be a computer scientist, I can apply that to farming, an engineer, a marketing person, uh, an artist, all that has applications in the food systems. And I think if we start doing that, people also start realizing that innovation can happen within Ghana and cut across to the world. So that is what Green Gold Farms is trying to do. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing what you've learned and, uh, and your visions as well. Errol, you've, we've touched on a little bit um, the sort of the missing voices of uh, uh, sort of lack of valuing of designers uh, in technology development. Um, what, why should designers work in open source? What it, what's in it for them? And mm -hmm. what can you, if you could elaborate a little bit more, <laughs> I know you've already touched on this, uh, <laughs> what can they uniquely bring to open source technology development? Yeah, designers in open source. Yeah, this is a this is a big one. Um, I'm going to try and keep it short, as short as I possibly can. So, 
There is a reasonably well-known um, article or paper, paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar um, around like open communities and open source. And I think it was the first paper uh, that talked about open source software being um, or existing because developers are scratching their own itch. So there is a kind of historical um, narrative of open source software being something that either um, one or few uh, code coders essentially or individuals create in order to serve a need of them of themselves, and I think one of the things that's talked about um, since the the publishing of that paper widely is how as soon as you put something out openly and publicly, it's no longer scratching just your own itch; it's scratching somebody's itch that sees it right and uses it so i think that there is a huge um challenge for a lot of open source software from both like small projects to bigger projects and we can we can say open source software but really when i say open source software i mean anything that is open source so whether it's your research whether it's data whether it's something that is open you create it initially closed and then you publish it make it open as soon as it's used by somebody else it, it needs to be usable by that person so it ceases to become something that is um good for just you and then you need to start considering how it can become better used more inclusive more accessible by all the other people that want to use it and will be using it and are using it essentially and that's kind of where often a lot of complexity comes into open source is when suddenly you've got kind of like this adoption, right? Of people wanting to use something, either data or research or tools or software. And they're like, I want it like this. I want something that does this, or I need this, or I'm working with people using this software. So not necessarily the people doing the improvements to the software, I mean, other people are using it and I'm facilitating that software for them, but they need it like this in a sense. So we be, you need to be able to facilitate this need for people that are like, quote unquote, end users. And I think that that then becomes very, very hard to do if you don't have a good design process, people involved that can do that function. And open source, again, is, like I said earlier, uh, a space that is historically isolated away from designers. We don't get taught it. Often we use a lot of actually open source tools and processes and the open web and all those kinds of things, but designers are largely unaware of what it is and what it can be. And I honestly think that it's there's so many opportunities for designers to get involved in projects that they, they can improve the processes of in terms of making it more usable for the people that actually need to use it. So similar to what I was saying before. So, the benefits for open projects involving designers are very um, apparent when you realize them, like they become more usable, you, you will be able to access the people through method, methods that designers use in, in a much more um, uh, proven kind of way in, in design spaces. But I do think that designers, because of that lack of training, knowledge, experience within open source often find a lot of the culture a bit unusual. Um, working openly isn't something that designers are often, until very recently, taught how to do. Designers are actually kind of taught um, from this, again, this colonial perspective of, you know, hide what you do until it's like at a state that is ready to reveal to the client and it's kind of like this wow moment and things like that. Whereas a lot of designers are now moving towards this process, which is much more iterative, much more, you know, show what you're working on and why you're working on and how you're working on it with the people that you're working on it as early as possible, with as many people within the organization as possible. So that is a huge culture change still for designers. We're, we're re relatively good at um, quick adaption as a, as a sort of um, uh, type of, of role, as it were, not to kind of generalize too much. Um, but yeah, it's still a huge thing. Like it's still a big culture change for us. So there are definitely clear benefits for open projects. There are benefits for designers that get to work on things that they care about. They get to not fill their portfolios with um, uh, projects that don't exist, essentially, and they get to actually contribute and participate and improve um, things uh, on the open web and things like that. Um, 
there's a big project that I did when I was at Ushahidi um, that was funded by a proprietary software uh, organization, Adobe. <laughs> um, but they um, really wanted to see what open design processes looked like for humanitarian uh, open source software, which was what Ushahidi created. So Ushahidi is a um, uh, data collection citizen led platform for reporting on human rights violations and um, democracy processes like worldwide it's an open software it was created um, in 2007 2008 uh, Kenyan um, originated software uh, around the the elections that were happening at the time and they created this software for the purposes of the monitoring those elections from a citizen led perspective not from a you know a uh, government or you know, mon non non-citizen or non-human perspective essentially and it's been used in lots and lots of different ways and really the benefits for designers in a lot of ways is you, you get to work on tools like that a lot of designers don't get to work on tools like that and participate in tools like that um, one last thing for open source or uh, open projects is that they if they are struggling with this way of being inclusive for the people that are actually using their tools and are struggling to meet those needs then designers are trained and are interested in that process right or at least good designers ones that are interested in human centeredness user centeredness are interested in how we um, understand those needs best and facilitate them within the tools that are used by the people that they are designing with um, yeah so Lots I can I can um, link some some of the resources from some of the projects that I've worked with. Um, for sure, there are lots and lots of different design communities, including open source design, which is a community that's been going for about five years or so, which is supporting the design community around open source projects and tools. Thank you, Errol, and thank you um, for for all of you for. Um, yeah, sharing again your your work here. Um, if I could just, I, my, here's my attempt to sort of summarize where we are. Um, so I think we we all through your experiences and, and your work, we understand the what well, I understand and the importance of sort of recognizing um, diverse contributions from from lift experts, from from designers, uh, people from in different geographies and roles and cultures. Um, the importance of working uh, with communities and really listening closely and deeply to the, to not only their needs, right, but also their dreams and their visions, and trying to facilitate that process of visioning and dreaming. Um, these approach, these two combined together, really, or the intention to do these things, at least, really have the power to create something, you know, that is much more beyond perhaps what we can imagine in the first place, and really a lot more powerful. Um, perhaps um, I just want to, yeah, thank you, Esther, for that uh, note in the chat. But I, I want to open the floor up to, uh, you know, brief questions perhaps for our panelists, if anyone has any. Um, Esther, handing over to you at this point. Thank you. So feel free to raise your hand and um, just ask your question if you have a question. And if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, just pop it in the chat so that I can read it. Um, we did have one question, which was not necessarily to the panelists, um, but maybe Anke, you would like to share your reflection on what, is there anything from the panel today that made you change your mind about this research project that you have shared in the chat? And don't, I'm putting you on the spot, so if you don't want to, uh, please oh, feel free. Uh, it's fine, thanks. Um, yes, um, I was really intrigued really listening uh, to David and then the knowledge of farmers we should more value and, and take into account. And that made me think of a project uh, within the Delft Global Initiative. Um, maybe uh, the two Delft colleagues are aware of that. There's, um, it's a lot about co-creation with people in the global south. So there is co-creation. I'm, I'm very fond of it. Um, and this is one of the older projects uh, with weather stations. And to put it in, in my words, is that they, we need weather stations so that the farmers can have a better um, harvest because um, then they would know better 
um, what the weather is and when to saw and when to put fertilizer and this sort of things. And I was just wondering whether um, whether David, uh, with his view, would think, well, we, we should better listen to them more carefully and we don't need this technology. Though I certainly know that David doesn't know the project, and, and, and so I'm, I'm fine if you say, well, I feel reluctant to saying anything about it yet, so we can be in touch uh, later on. That's also fine. Thanks, thanks, NK. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm actually aware of this project. Um, I, I learned about it when I was, I think, five or six years ago, maybe around 2016, 2015. I may be having my dates wrong, but I am aware of the, the Tamil project. And this is what I'll say. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the intention of having to make technologies available. What I've learned to ask myself when I'm bringing and thinking about technologies, one, have I really understood the lives that the people who are going to be using it um, live and the things that they really care about? So has this become a project that we think has worked in one context and we think we want to apply it in another context? Another metric, that I also use is, at the end of the day, does this technology make these people reliant on an external individual, external resource to be able to keep it thriving? What would be amazing to see that once this project is implemented in a short time, the community actually is innovating and creating and pushing it beyond the limits where they can actually create this weather stations, they can turn it into other things that apply for them. If that is not happening and it just becomes funding, 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 needing specific goals, then there's a question over there. So the way that I like it, can communities that technologies are embedded in actually become the originators or the people who take these technologies to the next level? If that is not happening, then maybe there's a question around, was this really solving a problem for them? So that's where I'll leave it. I've not followed up on the Tamil projects for a few years, so I can't really comment about the states, but this is my opinion around it. Thank you very I'm happy much. Happy to connect David. with you, so I'll follow up on that. Thank you very much, David and Anke, for, for um, sharing this as well. Um, no, we have a question. Uh, sorry, Esther, go ahead. <laughs> no worries. You're welcome to take over. Um, a question for Roberto. Do you want to pose it yourself, Juan, or should I just read it? Uh, hi, I can I can tell it myself. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the amazing discussion and the and the, and the great panelists. I'm really impressed to see this, uh, this very fruitful discussion. So in short, uh, my question for Roberto, being that proficient and good commandment of English for non-native English speakers can be another form of privilege, how can we ensure to include these people that are not native English speakers that cannot speak it in the inclusive co-creation of knowledge? Thank you. So Juan Carlo and I, we work together and, uh, and uh, uh, I welcome his question. It's a question that I, for, for which I don't have an answer at the moment. Um, good command of English is still uh, one of the conditions for you to, to, to come to, to Delft. Uh, students have to, to have a test and, and so on, right? Uh, but that limits us quite a lot. We know that there is a lot of good scholarship in Spanish, in French, in, 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 in the African languages being, uh, being, being produced that we don't have access to. That's a challenge, I think, for us to, to invent new forms of, um, of uh, translation and communication in academia, right? Uh, as, as you know, a lot of our activities are limited by language. We are cut off from, from a lot of uh, communities of knowledge that are formed ar around language. Uh, well, you know, uh, what happens in Latin America doesn't have any impact on scholarship uh, many times because it's not translated. So uh, I don't have an answer, but... Uh, 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 I, uh, 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 somebody was saying that they were not a tech. I'm a totally not a techie person, you know? So I'm, I'm, I invite the people who are techies to, to, to think with us. Maybe there are opportunities there. 
Thanks so much for that answer. And sorry to hear that you don't have a one size fits all solution for us. Um, hopefully we'll get there. Um, we have a question to Errol from Miguel. Um, how comes that closed software funded your open source projects? Any good, bad experiences and schemes on getting funding for these open source projects? Oh, a controversial one. Yeah, it's um, something that I often um, uh, sort of grimace when I uh, or want to like hide my face when I say that we, we receive funding from proprietary organizations to fund something that was open source and I think that this is a bigger question right and it, it actually touches on how things are funded in like um, alongside a, a line of um, how do we fund ethically fund critical digital infrastructure that is both open source and preferably open source because of the free and openness of, of open source in general, um, but also, you know, what what are funder structures and why do funders do what they do? And actually, this is a project we're working on. A, um, simply secure at the moment is how do we help funders better understand what funding critical digital infrastructure is and means uh, within an open source context? Uh, we're not we haven't completed that yet. There is a pre report that you can read. Um, I will find the link to it really, really quickly because I wasn't expecting to talk about it, but it is a really, really tricky topic. Um, essentially, uh, my personal ethics on this are that I, we didn't, Ushihidi was the organization that, that received the funding. So some of that funding enabled core functionality to happen at Ushihidi, which was human rights focused. And Ushihidi has their own policies and procedures with who can use their open source uh, tool and they historically have criteria for who can use it because it's open source so the idea is that actually anybody can download that open source and use it for any kind of purpose which actually may not be ethical and this is like a, again a huge complex problem about privacy and security within open source and lots of different complex things because Ushihidi and other open source projects will never quite know who is using that tool unless there are processes in place in, in order to track that. And often the people that we want to empower with tools are people that need privacy and security globally because they're doing risky human rights activity. So, you know, there's a lot of complicated conversations without simple answers here. Um, but my personal ethics were that I was happy to take Adobe's money in order to investigate how they can do better open source practices within their closed tools and how they can better help designers understand and access open source as an alternative. This was before um, Penpot existed. I don't know if people know about Penpot.app. It's an open source design tool, which is great. Um, it's fantastic. So, you know, I think that personal ethics aside, again, I don't have a perfect answer for how open source generally does better in the future around these things, but I think that we need to have more conversations about it for sure um, to be able to come to a agreement. Um, I think this also touches on the question that was about ethical open source licenses. Again, ethical open source licenses are great and I think that they absolutely need to exist and I want more organizations to use them, but how do you, again, ethically monitor and how do you even monitor open tools and open processes when they are truly truly open essentially um that's the real tricky thing um i'm just going to drop the report for funding digital infrastructure um this was the previous report that was done um, in partnership with an organization just in case people are interested in um reading a report <laughs> thanks so much um thanks all panelists for answering these very complicated questions um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop the Q&A because uh, we have the next session popping up in a bit. So I'm going to hand it back over to Emmy. Thank you very much, Esther. And thank you all for uh, all your wonderful questions um, and uh, for our to our panelists for, for being here and for answering them um, and sharing your perspectives as well. Uh, could we have a virtual round of applause? <laughs> It's not like a proper talk, but uh, I just want to say thank you and express our gratitude. Um, so uh, we'll be sharing a short summary, as I mentioned, uh, 
of this discussion in our website. Um, the, I'll put a link now, or Esther, if you could help out, please, uh, to the recording and summary and where this will be posted. posted. Um, if you're from TU Delft and you'd like to receive the latest updates on open science news, opportunities and events, please join our community and consider it at least. Um, and we have a link to the community also will be in the Zoom chat. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Uh, keep an eye out for our next coffees, uh, hopefully next month or the month after. But um, thank you so much once again to Errol, to David and to Roberto for joining us. And thank you so much for all of you for being here. So stop the recording at this point as well. Thank you. And I'll also thanks you. on behalf of the uh, diversity office from TU Delft. Oh, sorry. We, <laughs> yes. we also have presence for you. I think I don't know if Fatima's mic's working, but uh, um, yeah. So thanks. Yeah, like David said, thank you for organizing this, and um, we have a small, small attention for for the organizers and for the panelists. So if you, Emmy, can give us the contacts, or we can give you the small attention, and you can uh, make sure they get it. Would be great. Fantastic. Will do. Thank you.